greetings from Tokyo. Um, I wanted to hop on live really quickly. I expect there to be almost no one on this live right now um, because it's probably six o'clock in the morning, New York time, even earlier uh, if you're in other parts of the United States. Um, so if you're from California or anything like that, but if you're from New York, if you're hopping onto this live, congrats, early bird gets the worm. Um, but it is 8 p.m., a little past 8 p.m. right now, Tokyo time. Um, I just recently arrived to Tokyo for a congressional delegation trip, and I told you all um, that I was going to try to bring you along to this Codel as much as I can. So uh, what I wanted to do is just check in, um, give you guys a little bit of a rundown and some context for this uh, CODEL for this congressional delegation trip, answer some commonly asked questions, and hopefully be able to provide some essential context and background information for what you all will be seeing in, um, in my Instagram stories for the rest of the week. So, hey everybody, um, I love everybody checking in with their good mornings and the times that they're in. We see 6 a.m. New York, people checking in from Vermont, Montana. Um, someone said that they're checking in from deployment. So hello everyone. Um, and for me, it is 8.13 p.m. on February, what is it, February 19th, I believe? Oh no, it's February, um, February 20th. So it's 8 p.m. of February 20th, so that's tomorrow for some of you all here in Tokyo. Um, but I wanted to let you all know a little bit about what we're doing here, right? Uh, when I first started putting um, and informing you all through Instagram Live and stories last week that I was going to a congressional delegation trip to Tokyo, there were some people in, com in my comments being like, oh, you know, I was with you with everything you were saying until you said you were going on this trip. I don't approve of members of Congress going out uh, to these, you know, trips. Why are my taxpayer dollars going towards this? Well, let's talk about that right up front. Um, first of all, don't worry. A lot of these trips are not necessarily funded entirely um, by taxpayer dollars. In fact, uh, the travel for delegation trips like these uh, the funding for it either has to come through um, separate fundraising or the host country uh, will be facilitating that. Some other trips may be a little bit differently, maybe a little bit different if they're military associated, um, but this trip is primarily centered on a couple of different things. Um, I would say it's centered on economics, trade, climate, and human rights. Uh, the actual central focus of this trip is what is known as a trilateral legislative exchange. So I will be meeting with members of the Japanese uh, parliament, otherwise known as the Diet, here in Japan. I just met with one today. Um, and I will also be going to South Korea for one or two days and meeting with members of parliament there alongside members of the Japanese parliament also going to South Korea. And why do we do this? Why are we doing this? Well, let's give some important context to what's going on. Um, later this year in May, President Biden is going to be attending what is known as the G7 summit. Um, the G7 summit is um, it's the group of seven, the gathering of seven in the major economies in the world and Japan will be hosting the G7. Now, when we have presidents and heads of state come to gather uh, for the G7, the G20, or any of these other kind of summits or conferences, they aren't just going, dropping out from the sky, only individually meeting one another, right? There's a ton of political and diplomatic legwork um, that leads up to some of these gatherings. In addition to that, uh, you will see very often, you know, once every several years, there will be 
major legislation, whether it's a trade agreement, a proposed trade agreement. Uh, sometimes you will hear, you know, during the last presidency, President, former President Trump talking about tariffs, all these kinds of things. And they often um, require, again, a lot of legwork and diplomacy that can lead up to uh, moments of positive developments and policies between governments. And my hope um, here in this trip is that as someone who is the author of the Green New Deal um, and really hoping to make sure that we can facilitate global cooperation around climate change and reducing our carbon emissions, that we can figure out how we actually start really collaborating globally on drawing down um, our emissions and working together to meet a global challenge. Uh, in addition to that, there are also really important backdrops when it comes to human rights, particularly women's rights and LGBT trans rights and marriage equality um, across borders, um, as well as a couple of other things like energy sources, looking at how Japan is dealing and approaching uh, nuclear energy. I am super excited about the bullet trains here, the Shin otherwise known as the Shinkansen system, um, and how we can bring high-speed rail and bullet trains to the United States. And so there are a lot of things that other countries do, specifically Japan does uh, quite excellently. And there are so many things that people say are impossible in the United States. We can't build high-speed rail in the United States. We can't build out alternative forms of energy, whether it's geothermal, solar wind, etc. in the United States. We can't have childcare. We can't have universal health care. Well, let's go to a country that actually does these things and figure out how they structure it and maybe take some inspiration back uh, to the United States. So really excited about that. Um, I wanted to give you all a little bit of a rundown in terms of what we did today. So we arrived, um, this is a bipartisan delegation. So there are uh, Republican members on this trip. There are Democrats on this trip. In terms of the Democrats on this trip, we have uh, Congressman Mark Takano, uh, who is a Japanese American. Um, he's from the United States. His heritage is his family heritage is Japanese. He's the chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, we also have uh, Congressman Frank Pallone, who is, oh, I'll, I, I say chair, but now the Democrats are in the minority. They're technically the ranking member, but the senior most Democrat. Uh, so, you know, Mark Takano is the chair slash ranking member of, um, of the Veterans Affairs Committee. Frank Pallone is the chair slash ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is one of the most powerful committees in all of Congress that presides over energy and commerce. Um, also with me here and alongside in this trip is Maxwell Frost, uh, who is our youngest, our new youngest uh, member, and so we are the youngest male and female members um, uh, in Congress, respectively. And uh, we also have a Republican member, uh, Congressman French Hill, um, who is along with us here in Tokyo. And we are, will be meeting with prime ministers. We will be meeting with um, members of parliament. And we will also be meeting with advocates, everyday people, um, and a lot of scientists and other sorts of experts as well. So in terms of what we did today, uh, a lot of the members of the delegation arrived last night and jet lag be damned, we were up. Um, and Adam between seven and 8.30 this morning, Tokyo time. Um, and we headed straight to a meeting uh, with LGBT advocates. So something that's really important in terms of what's happening here in Japan is um, Japan is the only member of the G7 that does not have marriage equality and LGBT equality protections specifically in place. And this is a really significant 
uh, this is starting to become an increasingly significant issue. And right before we arrived here, the U.S. delegation arrived here, there was kind. There's been kind of a a a bit of a scandal that has unfolded in the administration. There was a member of the Japanese um, administration that was caught in off the record comments making very discriminatory statements about LGBT people, saying that you know he wouldn't want to ever live next to them. Um, and so on and so forth. And these comments were leaked and made public. Um, and it is quite shocking. Uh, and I think it's fair to characterize this as a pretty shocking development uh, that these comments have been made public. It's a bit of a revelation. And there's kind of a, um, a, a moment of reckoning here in Japan because between this as to what's going on right now, the fact that Japan is the only member of the G7 that does not have marriage equality or LGBT anti-discrimination protections in place, as well as the fact that Tokyo and Japan is set to host the G7 in May, we're starting to kind of reach a bit of a precipice here when it comes to to LGBT rights in Japan. And so um, while this isn't the entirety of our trip, of course, um, one of the things that we are going to engage in diplomatically is uh, really expressing the, that it is the, our view um, that marriage equality and LGBT protections um, being enacted in Japan would be a very, very strong and important role in U.S.-Japan relations as well as general relations in the G7. Um, the more we can all share our values across countries, the more we can cooperate. And even when it comes to the economic implications of things like trade and things like travel, um, it's it makes countries, any country that has protections for, legal protections for communities in place, whether they're women, whether they're LGBT uh, communities, other sorts of protected minorities, the more protections those are in place, the easier it is for Americans to visit places like Japan, potentially move to places like Japan if that is an option or in, you know something that they want to exercise in their life or conduct business in Japan. Uh, the more integrated our society is, we want to make sure that everyone can enjoy those protections in other places as well. So this is something that I think is going to be an important part of the message that we have to send um, it, uh, with, our, um, with our colleagues in Japan saying, hey, listen, part of having strong democracies includes really strong human rights protection. So my hope would be that um, we can make some progress there, here, and that Japan uh, will be able to make some strong progress there. But uh, what we're here to do is also expands far beyond just that issue. We have really strong um, economic you know, implications and economic policy that we're here to discuss, as well as energy policy and climate policy. Um, but as, but the first part of the day was meeting with an incredible transgender ad, uh, activist here um, in uh, Shibuya, um, and his name is Mr. Fumino Sugiyama. And he has actually let help lead the way into having same-sex partnerships recognized in certain wards of Tokyo, which is a really critical first step. His story was incredible. I definitely recommend looking him up um, if this is an area, issue area that you're passionate about. Um, after that, uh, I also met with a lot of young women here in Japan uh, in talking about how they are navigating um, their role in society and kind of the state of women in Japan and their ability to navigate um, in uh, Japanese society as well. And then after that, uh, I we were able to do a really important infrastructure stop and I was able to look at the Shinkansen, everybody. We went to the bullet trains and 
Um, I got to say, the bullet trains in Japan, I mean, they're, they're famous, right? They're famous worldwide, but I was able to see them in person. And not only were we able to tour the public areas, like the platforms for the bullet trains and the Shinkansen here in Japan, and see how they are set up, but I was actually also, they were, actually were able to bring us back to the control center uh, for these places and really from a public policy perspective looking at how do we set up something like this in the United States. The way that the bullet train system and the Shikansen system is set up in Japan is just mind-blowing. We are talking about something like 65 percent of Japan's GDP is tracked into geographic areas that are connected by the Shinkansen, and they are in they are ridiculously safe in the entire history of the Japanese bullet train system. There has not been a single passenger casualty due to train dysfunction or derailment. Um, the, there are virtually no derailments on the Shinkansen system uh, in the 50 plus year history of, of this system. They are also actively building out um, and adding to this system, testing out new maglev technology and adding segments to this. And for reference um, to, the, to the U.S., it takes about six hours, anywhere between four to six hours, depending on how often you're stopping, to drive from New York City to Washington, D.C. Roughly speaking, that is almost about the, uh, the, the rough distance between um, Tokyo and Kyoto or Osaka, even a little bit further. And the train from the Shinkansen train from Tokyo to Kyoto is about two hours. So six hour drive, four to six hour drive to a two hour bullet train drive, a uh, two hour bullet train ride. And if you're a New Yorker, I would describe the Shinkansen as kind of like a blend between the Metro North uh, commuter rail and the Amtrak. What is, What was so mind blowing to me about the Shinkansen um, is that they is the frequency with which they run. Uh, when I first looked at the Shikansen schedule, I thought I was like, oh, I looked up the wrong schedule. It runs every six minutes. There's a train from Kyoto uh, from from Tokyo to Kyoto that runs every six to ten minutes. Um, on a bullet train, a two hour ride. I mean, could you imagine a train that would go from New York City to Washington DC or from Houston to Dallas or from Kansas City to Chicago that leaves every 10 minutes? It is shocking. Um, and honestly, for not that much money, um, it, you know, it's it's not the cheapest thing in the world, but it's also not the most expensive thing in the world either. It's about a hundred bucks that will get you from one city to another within two hours. You can bring your luggage with you. It is completely comfortable. Um, it's above ground, super rapid, and there's public transit in both of those cities so that you don't need to rent a car when you get off um, in that area. So it is really incredible. And what they're seeing is that they're actively adding to the Shinkansen system. And from what has been tracked, um, growth in, G in GDP is, is loosely correlated to growth in the Shinkansen system. So the more rail, the more tracks of rail that they add, and the more ridership there is, the more growth in GDP there is. And this is really you know, has such explosive potential in the United States. Imagine being able to go from Miami to Orlando, um, going from Houston to Dallas, to Austin, to San Antonio, to go from Los Angeles to San Francisco on a, on a high-speed bullet train from, you know, Las Vegas to San Diego. These are, th this is what is possible in the United States. 
Um, the problem, of course, that we deal with is private interests and lobbying um, to try to prevent these systems from being put into place. But the amount of economic potential and explosion is just, it, it, it's almost inconceivable. Japan is the world's third largest economy. And when you look at Japan on a map, you don't have the same geographic area that larger countries like the United States, China, um, you know, Brazil, Mexico. These are places with very large geographic area. But Japan has been able to build the world's third largest economy in a much smaller just geographic area. And I think a lot of that has to do with the economic activity and the density and just the explosion in uh, what people are able to do when they are so easily connected by public transit. So I think it's incredible. Some people, I'm going to dive into some of the questions here. Some people say, can you smoke on the bullet train? Okay, first of all, someone said, can you smoke weed on the bullet train? I mean, this is, first of all, <laughs> sir, <laughs> that's not legal in Japan, but there is a culture just around smoking cigarettes that's very different in Japan than it is in the United States. There are kind of like smoking rooms. Um, not, it's not like the, the, the actual train, it's not that there are smoking cars or anything like that, but there are these kind of weird rooms. Think of it almost as like a bathroom in a way that you can go to smoke, um, and things like that. Um, someone say, did you fly commercial from DC to Tokyo? Yes, I did. Um, I'm taking a look at, um, what I'm just, sorry, I'm just, I'm taking a look at some of the things you all have here. Um, failure of to enact regulations. I mean, this is very much in contrast um, with, and it is important for us to talk about some of the failures that we have with our rail system in the United States. Obviously what's happening in East Palestine, Ohio is a major crisis and these derailments are incredibly serious as well. The United States has well over a thousand derailments per year and you contrast that with the Japanese Shinkansen system, which has had none. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Yes, lack of regulation. Yes, these private rail companies are lobbying to make it less safe, to reduce labor standards and all of that. Um, those are really important parts of the conversation, but there's also an infrastructure element to this as well. A lot of the rail is really old and it's not being maintained and it's only getting older and there's a lot of lobbying by these companies to actively prevent both not just regulations and increasing the standards for performance but to prevent additional investment so that we have new rail a lot of these companies do not want the competition of new high-speed rail and so we're stuck with these really old rail systems um, that rely on very old technology. A lot of this lobbying is going to uh, going towards eroding both labor standards. We see a lot of our rail workers. We've, we went through a lot of this. A lot of our rail workers have been fighting for elevated labor standards. And it, this is very much a, a stark contrast to what we have in the United States. Now, something that I thought was really fascinating about the system here in Japan is that the system here in Japan all is also privately owned, uh, which I found quite surprising. Now, to be fair, the Shinkansen system was built publicly. Um, it was starting to be built, it, the, you know, the plans and the designs for it first started in the 1930s, uh, but it opened around 1964 and the Shinkansen system was very publicly subsidized and, and publicly built uh, and operated until about 1989, where it actually became privatized. And something that I find very interesting is that, you know, in the United States, a lot of times when things get privatized, it goes, you know, it really 
that's very consistent with it eroding, with a profit motive, lower quality, everything starts just getting squeezed for every dollar. Um, and in Japan, that that was not the case. The privatization of the Shinkansen system does not seem to have had the kind of calamitous effects that privatization in the United States has had. Um, and I'm kind of like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really kind of looking at that and trying to figure out why. Uh, and I'm going to dig into that a little bit further. Some of the initial, um, uh, you know, when I ask about why that is, some of the initial explanations that I'm receiving are actually very rooted in culture. And Japanese culture is completely different than US and Western culture. And it's almost like arriving, it, it's really hard to describe. I have been to other places. I've been to Latin America. I've been um, to, to other places in the world. I've, I went to Turkey last year um, and, and trying to describe different cultures in different places can be difficult sometimes, but you know, American culture is so rooted. It's hard sometimes until or unless you take yourself out of American culture to realize, for example, how much American culture shapes American business, shapes American policy, shapes American, like really hard, um, you, I should say U.S. decision making. Things like individualism is a very core, concrete, Amer U.S. bedrock value. Now, that may not be something you as an individual value, but it is a core cultural value. You know, U.S. individualism, American exceptionalism, manifest destiny, those types of things that you learn about in high school, even if you don't agree with them, they have a lot of influence in not just American culture, but that culture influences the way that we do business, the way we build our infrastructure, the way that we organize our society. And Japan has very different values that they organize their culture and society on. I think collectivism is not as taboo to say the least here. Uh, in Japan, Japan is a much more egalitarian society compared to the United States. And I want to tread carefully here because as someone, this is my first time visiting Japan, I am not an expert on Japan. And I think it can be really easy to overly romanticize a culture or just get it wrong based on your first impression. But um, I do, so I, I want to kind of, put a big asterisk on my remarks and I want to communicate very clearly that I am coming as a novice um, and, you know, kind of talk about and just, just state that um, just outright and clearly in Congress. Uh, when you speak on the House floor, I'll say I revise my right to, I, I, re I reserve my right to revise and extend my remarks. Um, so I'll say that here, but, you know, Japanese culture is so different and the values that Japanese culture is rooted in is so different based on the values that American culture is rooted in. And so when I asked, like, why is it that the Shinkansen system is run by private companies, but they don't seem to try to cut every corner and erode labor standards. I mean, when we pulled in with the bullet trains, and I'm going to try to put, put some of this stuff on my Instagram stories. I tried to take videos so that you all can see. Um, but when, when the bullet trains kind of come in, there is almost like a fleet of a cleaning crew waiting to come in. And the bullet train kind of comes in and there's 15 minutes uh, that the whole crew has to come in clean the trains and and go out. And when I think about if we had a system like this that was privatized in the United States, 
that those cleaning crews would be the first things to go. Their schedules would be messed with. It would be inconsistent. The labor force would be cut in half. There would be all of these ways, all of these pressures to to cut corners in order to increase that profit margin. And so when I'm here and I'm looking at the Shinkansen that's run by a private company and all of these things are there, I'm like, why, why has that cost saving, that corner cutting not happened here? And again, I want to dive into this further. Um, and I definitely welcome alternative perspectives here from people who are really experienced with it. But one of those explanations is rooted in culture. Um, so, you know, that's something that I'm finding to be really interesting here. Conversely, um, you know, again, it's not to overly romanticize and it's not to put an overly rosy fo- you know, picture on things, but it's also not to put an overly negative photo on things, but trying to just take in information as much as I can. Um, and so like a flip side for that, for example, is the opportunities that women may feel that they have or may not have access to in Japanese society. But then again, as an asterisk to that, in Japan, they have you know, much more provisions based on child care. There's a far more accommodations for child care. There is a universal health care system here in Japan, which I mean, of course, is something that we're trying to achieve in the United States and can feel so far off. But, you know, one thing that I really feel so far from J- in Japan in my first day here is honestly an overwhelming sense of hope. Um, sometimes being in the United States, so for context, this is only my second congressional delegation trip in my entire time in Congress. Uh, the first one was a brief CODEL to COP26 in Scotland, uh, which was the UN Climate Summit. Um, but this is my first time going to a CODEL that is actively touring the infrastructure and actively touring the policies and engaging in diplomacy uh, with another country. And what is so hopeful to me about this, about being here in Japan, is that in the United States, especially as a progressive, so often I am told that what we're fighting for and what we want is impossible and that it's unrealistic and that it's naive and that it's silly and it's not viable and that I'm like a child for thinking that these things are possible. And to go to a country that actually has these things makes me feel like it's not impossible. And is it uphill? Yes. Are the odds long? Yes. But it is not impossible. And this is a country that not only has universal health care, that not only has a bullet train public infrastructure system that is robust, that is robust, that not only has child care, that not only cares about the environment, that not only cares about uh, cultural preservation, but it is also successful. It is also the third largest economy in the world. And it's not to say that everything is perfect here. It's not to say that it is without its challenges. It's not even to say that we should just, you know, the United States should be just like Japan. I'm not saying those things, but it's saying that all of these things that we're constantly told are impossible are possible. They're possible. And a better world is possible. And to see that even in Japanese culture, that there is still a a striving to make improvements based on where we are, um, is really, really important. And I think sometimes when we're in the US, it's so easy to get discouraged and feel like we're kind of getting ground down Uh, because things can just feel so difficult and so impossible. And we see our labor standards feel like they're eroding and environmental standards feel like they're eroding. And it feels like, 
I mean, American capitalism has a unique, in my view, has a unique brutality to it. Um, I mean, people are so close to being homeless. And all of us, myself included, all of us are closer to being homeless than to being a billionaire. And when you live in a society like that, it, it can just feel like things getting better feel so far away. But when traveling to a place that has actually accomplished these things, it really makes me feel so encouraged and hopeful about what we will be able to accomplish. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see this. You know, some folks are talking about policing and things like that. Yeah, there are completely different ways in which public safety is approached here in Japan. I mean, it's truly mind blowing. So uh, today I toured the Shinkansen. I'll try to put up some of that footage uh, on my Instagram stories if I can. I also attended a briefing about um, what has happened since the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011 um, for, I'll say some rules for the road. I, at, for security purposes and other purposes, I am not able to preview with you all what I will be doing the next day, but I am hoping um, as much as I can to recap with you all what we've done at the end of the day um, and, and what I did, um, you know, the day before. So there's going to be that. Um, I am going to be kind of fundamentally disconnected a little bit from the news cycle in the United States. So I just want you all to know that there's likely to, going to be some delays. Um, it's already kind of almost 9 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, it's it's 9 p.m. on February 20th in Tokyo. Um, but then on top of that, you know, there's that means times when I'm sleeping is times when you all will be awake. So just if you all could have some patience a little bit on some of that time delay. Um, but I'm going to try to give you all as many updates as we can. And I'm really excited about what we have to learn here uh, in Japan. And I'm also hopeful that maybe some of our counterparts in Japan can have some things to learn um, and have, you know, be able to, to learn some things from us in exchange. Uh, and I'm also particularly hopeful about the backdrop and the immediate possibilities for marriage equality, LGBT and women's rights um, on the precipice of the G7. So we will see uh, what there is to come, um, but I'm incredibly excited and we'll give you all a report out. All right, bye-bye from Tokyo. Hello everyone, greetings from Tokyo. Um, I wanted to hop on live really quickly. I expect there to be almost no one on this live right now um, because it's probably six o'clock in the morning, New York time, even earlier uh, if you're in other parts of the United States. Um, so if you're from California or anything like that, but if you're from New York, if you're hopping onto this live, Congrats, early bird gets the worm. Um, but it is 8 p.m., a little past 8 p.m. right now, Tokyo time. Um, I just recently arrived to Tokyo for a congressional delegation trip. And I told you all um, that I was going to try to bring you along to this Codel as much as I can. So uh, what I wanted to do is just check in. Um, give you guys a little bit of a rundown and some context for this uh, CODEL, for this congressional delegation trip, answer some commonly asked questions, and hopefully be able to provide some essential context and background information for what you all will be seeing in, um, in my Instagram stories for the rest of the week. So, hey everybody, um, I love everybody checking in with their good mornings and the times that they're in. We see 6 a.m. New York, people checking in from Vermont, Montana. Um, someone said that they're checking in from deployment. So hello, everyone. Um, and 
For me, it is 8.13 p.m. on February, what is it, February 19th, I believe? Oh no, it's February, um, February 20th. So it's 8 p.m. of February 20th, so that's tomorrow for some of you all here in Tokyo. Um, but I wanted to let you all know a little bit about what we're doing here, right? Uh, when I first started putting um, and informing you all through Instagram Live and stories last week that I was going to a congressional delegation trip to Tokyo, there were some people in, com in my comments being like, oh, you know, I was with you with everything you were saying until you said you were going on this trip. I don't approve of members of Congress going out uh, to these you know, trips. Why are my taxpayer dollars going towards this? Well, let's talk about that right up front. Um, first of all, don't worry a lot.